talk. And believe me, I'm going to make him sing like a birdie because on screen he may be hard as nails Jane Bond, but off it, he's just another sissy actor. And after all that testosterone and uber chick flick, if ever there was one, arrives this week in the form of Failure to Launch, starring Sarah Jessica Parker and Matthew McConaughey in a tale of love, nature and very violent paintballing. The film's premise may strike a particularly strong chord here in Britain, where just last year a survey for BBC Two's The Money programme found that one in four British parents still have at least one adult child living at home. Here Mr McConaughey is Trip, an eligible 30-something bachelor whose reluctance to fly the nest is making mum and dad increasingly desperate. If only he could meet a nice girl, settle down and get the hell out of the house. However, the chances of their dreams coming true suddenly surge when their stay-at-home son has a chance encounter with that very nice girl, Sarah Jessica Parker. Oh, ho, ho. there's what you're talking about. It's nice, huh? Yeah, I make fun of my parents, but these babies are sweet. I'm Paula. I'm Trip. You know, usually I don't sleep with someone on the first date. Oh, I don't think this counts as a first date. It would be a date if you asked me to have a drink tonight. Mm -hmm. So far, so rom-com. But all is not what it seems. You see, Sarah Jessica Parker's actually been paid to pick up Matthew McConaughey in soft furnishings. And that's not all. Her clients are his parents, scheming to make their 30-something son leave home. He's He's smart, he's sweet, he's funny. We had a wonderful first meeting. I see incredible potential here. So all systems are go. Based on the initial personality assessment, I think that I can have your son moved out of this house and living on his own by June 15th. <laughs> Hallelujah! Just a quick note to Hollywood at this point. Men who still live with their parents well into their 30s tend not to look like Matthew McConaughey. But who needs gritty realism when they've got a cast of endearingly quirky friends, Cheers. Cheers. angry squirrels, <laughs> and a small screen star enjoying a movie career second time around. For a lot of people, they think that Sex and the City was the beginning of my career, and in a way, I'm fine about that because it takes 20 years off my life, so <laughs> I'm fine. So that means I'm, you know, I'm a very tender age at this point. <laughs> well, so far, I must say, I'm very impressed. Beautiful setting, simple meal. I assume this technique has worked in the past? Uh, yes, ma'am, it has. Is it working now? You know what? Kind of is. Uh-oh. Let's go for a walk. But I'm not done with lunch. Uh, yeah, you are. Ooh, ooh. Hey, I, seriously, I'm not, I'm not one of those girls who don't eat. I want, I, I, I wanted all that. See, technically, this is not my boat. Actually, it's not my boat in any way. <laughs> what? Failure to lunch. Get it? Oh, please yourselves. Any romantic comedy starring Sarah Jessica Parker is bound to call to mind her award-winning success in the show that made her a household name, Sex and the City. But she says it's hardly fair to compare a one-off film with a long-running TV show. We had seven years to really create a real person, you know, like a real person with, we got to see really a whole life, a full life. Um, and so I can't really apply the same standard. How will I choose? Oh, this is going very well. Good. So we can go now. Mm. Not until I get the nod. If I don't get the nod, the friend's under mine. Mm. I think you're getting the nod. <laughs> The modern social phenomenon of grown-up children living at home may mean that failure to launch hits a pertinent contemporary note, but that isn't why the film works. It succeeds because its strengths are timeless, confident comic timing and entertaining chemistry between two talented and attractive stars. As ever, Sarah Jessica Parker is a charming screen presence, and Matthew McConaughey not only thinks of the ladies by displaying his Ross-like abs at regular intervals, but also delivers a deft, enjoyably gormless performance. He's clearly comfortable with the material provided by first-time film writers Tom Astle and Matt Ember, and the same goes for supporting players such as Kathy Bates as McConaughey's mum and Zoe Deschanel as Parker's flatmate, who have the sure-footed feel which marks out the better American rom-coms. Of course you know all along where the movie's going to end up, and its chief flaw is that even at 97 minutes, it takes a little too long getting there. That languid pacing means that Failure to Launch isn't up there with the finest films of its kind, but if you catch it once it opens this weekend, I suspect you'll find that it's better than most. Frankly, any film which can have your middle-aged critic welling up at the sight of Sarah Jessica Parker winning a game of paintball must have something to commend it. And after that dramatic revelation, here are some more updates on events in the business we call film. What's a Faustin? 
It's a guy who doesn't care about books or interesting films and things. Your mother's brother, Ned, is also a Philistine. Opening in cinemas on the 7th of April is The Squid and the Whale, which earned writer-director Noah Baumbach an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay. Set in Brooklyn during the 1980s, the film follows two brothers as their parents, played by Jeff Daniels and Laura Linney, go through an acrimonious divorce. Okay. Your mom and I, we're going to separate. I've got you Tuesday, Wednesday, and every other Thursday. Well, what about the cat? The cat? We didn't discuss the cat. The film is semi-autobiographical, and it wasn't just the script which drew on Baumbach's adolescent experiences. I used books from my childhood, paintings that were on our walls. I shot in my high school. I shot in my old neighborhood. So it was a, I tried to do it whenever I could. My father said you had a weak handshake, which is a sign of indecision. His hands are so huge, I can't get a good grip. With an eye on the Easter holiday market, The Shaggy Dog stars Tim Allen as a hotshot lawyer who discovers what it means to feel rough, or even rough, rough. Out this week, it will be joined in cinemas on the 7th of April by Ice Age 2, The Meltdown, the sequel to the huge hit of four years ago, which reunites Manny, Sid and Diego as they face the end of the world as they know it. And staying animated, London Science Museum is preparing to celebrate the genius of Pixar, the groundbreaking production house responsible for Toy Story, The Incredibles and all those other computer-generated masterpieces in between. Hundreds of drawings, paintings and sculptures will be on display to give an exclusive insight into how talking fish and furry monsters are brought to life, complemented by workshops and visits from Oscar-winning animators. The exhibition opens on the 1st of April for 10 weeks, and there was I hoping it would run to infinity and beyond. Tommy Lee Jones briefly sacked his own daughter from his first film as a director, The Three Burials of Melchiara's Estrada. Now that's commitment for you. Winner of two major prizes at Cannes last May and featuring cinematography from double Oscar winner Chris Menges, this contemporary Western story of honour and friendship is out on Friday. After the Oscar-nominated success of Hotel Rwanda, another insight into the horror which racked that African nation in the mid-90s arrives this week in the form of Shooting Dogs from Scottish director Michael Caton Jones. In a story drawing on actual events, John Hurt plays a Catholic priest running a school with the assistance of Hugh Dancy's idealistic volunteer. When the majority Hutu ethnic group turns on the dominant Tutsi minority, Hurt opens the school as a safe house for refugees. Tell them to open the gates. This is a military base, not a refugee camp. Actually, it's a school. My school. However, as the killing escalates, the complexities of international politics leave Hurt, Dancy and the UN soldiers powerless to help those relying on them for protection. We can only fire if fired upon. The parameters of our operation are very clear. Some people are starting to call this a genocide. Would you call it that? Uh, well, uh... Because you know that if this is a genocide, you are obligated to intervene. Stop the camera, please. Stop it now! An undeniably powerful and important piece of work, Shooting Dogs opens on Friday, a release date which it shares with The White Countess, the last film from the partnership of director James Ivory and producer Ismail Merchant, whose death last year ended their professional association of more than 40 years. Like earlier celebrated productions such as A Room with a View and The Remains of the Day, their final collaboration is a period drama, the story taking place in China in the late 1930s. With a Japanese invasion looming, the country is in the throes of a power struggle between communists and nationalists. But Shanghai remains an international melting pot where almost anything goes, and where the nightlife offers jaded characters like Rafe Fine's American diplomat a chance to escape the cares of the day. I am pleased to make your, your acquaintance, Mr. Matsuda. Matsuda. And you, sir? I believe you are Mr. Todd Jackson, the distinguished American diplomatist. Not so distinguished. The same Todd Jackson. I believe whom the English foreign minister once referred to as the last hope for the League of Nations. Oh, I was all a few years back. A lot's happened since then. I have no quarrel with your countrymen anymore, Mr. Matsuda, or with anybody else. Besides, I came in here to get away from all of that. 
Fiennes has plenty he'd rather forget, having lost both his family and his sight by the time he meets Sophia, played by Natasha Richardson, a Russian aristocrat whose family have fled the country after the revolution. I just felt so much for this woman, what it must have been like to lose absolutely everything, to have to leave your country, lose your husband, your whole way of life, and end up working on the streets in Shanghai. She's reduced to working as a nightclub hostess to support her rather ungrateful family until Fiennes proposes that she join him in his new project. The place that I'm going to open, it'll be a bar. You know, a little dancing and a little music. And, but it won't be like this. It'll be nothing like this. Uh, my place will be just the way that I've seen it up here, inside. And I, I need you to be my, my centerpiece. The film setting may be a little different, but the hallmarks of a merchant ivory production are in place. A literary script from remains of the day author Kazuo Ishiguro, bucket loads of repressed emotion. Strange to think that all this time I, I never knew how beautiful you were. Plus a job lot of British acting talent, including three actresses from the same family. Well, we decided on really right at the beginning that we wanted to have Natasha. And then since we'd worked with Vanessa so many times and she seemed so appropriate, we decided that if she was free that we would like to have her. And then we thought, well, what the hell, let's get Lynn too. It was great to see, you know, Lynn and Vanessa and Natasha all together. It was very moving. As the Japanese enter Shanghai, the Countess's family prepare to flee once again. But not everyone will get away. Hong Kong is British, very hard to buy the correct papers. In the end, we weren't able to buy papers for you too. But uh, you're leaving me behind? The White Countess features all of the characteristics which, perhaps unfairly, are automatically associated with merchant ivory films. I say unfairly because the company's range has extended well beyond costume drama, but its name invariably calls to mind the attributes on display here. A beautifully realised period setting, populated by upper-class characters, played by talented actors. No surprises there, then. What's unfortunate is the absence of passion and dramatic thrust. The problems faced by Natasha Richardson's Countess aren't sufficiently compelling to drive the story along, and some of the key relationships are a little too strained and aloof to be genuinely interesting. Partly through lack of competition, the most intriguing storyline involves the excellent Ray Fiennes and Hiroyuki Sanada as the mysterious Mr. Matsuda, the man whose presence makes Shanghai's locals justifiably nervous. Their evolving friendship is fascinating, but this subplot carries a weight that it really shouldn't, which does rather point up the shortcomings of a movie called The White Countess. A film which I doubt will disappoint the many fans of Merchant Ivory costume dramas when it opens across the country on Friday, but which for all its splendid visuals and evocative music lacks any lasting emotional impact. Also released this week is Firewall, a tense technological thriller which represents a welcome return to the screen for Harrison Ford. However, I'm not going to talk about it at length now, as on Tuesday the 4th of April on BBC One, a new edition of Hollywood Greats gives me the chance to share some face time with the man himself. Tell you what I was pleased to see the return of. A good part for a dog. Yes, there is a good part for a dog. Uh, I wish to hell we had gotten a good dog. <laughs> I mean, I've said nice things about all the other actors, yeah. but the dog was a pain in the ass. Cut loose. In which particular way? Um, in the usual way. Um, um, you know, failed to do anything uh, the same way twice. Was uh, terrified of me, so would never come to me. I did my best. I did my best. I imagine that's what it must be like to work with Keanu Reeves. I I'm not going to draw you on that. <laughs> Why have you done this for God's sake? They're children. Daddy. I want to know what you want. And I want to know now. Firewall opens across the country on Friday. And as Mr. Ford prepares to pick up his whip for the long rumoured return of Indiana Jones, it's time to catch up with the original action hero, Bond, James Bond. There can hardly be a more iconic role in film history than Commander James Bond. And now the torch, the shoulder holster, the Aston Martin are being passed on to a new generation as Daniel Craig takes on the mantle of 007. I'm keen to learn how he's finding life on Her Majesty's Secret Service and happily, Mr. Bond is expecting me. <laughs> Thank you. 
Daniel, thank you so much. Great to see you again. Nice to see you. Now, do you know why I'm here? No idea. Well, I hate to break this year, but they've had a look at the dailies, and mm. frankly, they're not what they hoped. Oh, well. So they're thinking of giving me a try. Well, good. At the part which set, really has been mine since I was eight. I, I know that. I, you told me that last time I saw you. <laughs> um, oh. So when are we going to go and start trying on the costumes? I don't know. I think I've got to, I've got to lose a bit first to get into those T-shirts that they've had tailored for you. Um, joking aside, and sadly we were joking there, mm. uh, what made you finally decide to, to take the leap and take on the part? Because I know they were wooing you for a while and it was going for a while. What, what was the deciding factor? Um, the script, really. I mean, um, and believe me, when I, I, I picked it up and I thought, well, you know, this is going to be an easy, easy decision. I'm, I'm going to read this, hate it, and say, no, no, you know, move on. And I read it within about sort of 20 minutes, just rushed through it, and then reread it and thought, oh, here we go, I'm going to have to do this now. <laughs> so you were kind of doomed? I kind of was, yeah. Um, I seem to remember that, that it kind of lays the, the foundation for why he becomes the man he is and how the rest of the, the stories play out, essentially. Yeah. Uh, it humanises him to an extent. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the plan. I mean, definitely what you see with him, I think, in this is um, he's not infallible. I just wanted to sort of see him make a few mistakes because then I think the drama of it is sort of better when he gets it right. Um, I mean, it's, it's purely selfish. It's not because I just want to make him sort of like a deeper character. It's just yeah. that I want, to, I want to make him, I want to make the audience sort of go, oh my God, it's all going to go wrong. I believe that it's going to go wrong, and then when it goes right, it's much more exciting. I don't know if they're leaving it in, but in the book, mm. there's a scene where Bond gets tied to a chair and has his testicle severely whacked. Mm -hmm. I think with bamboo canes. Yeah, yeah. That's happening? Mm -hmm. uh, a date you're looking forward to, the mm -hmm. filming of that? Well, you know. I mean, we've been discussing it at length. They're going to have to be careful with the angles on that one, aren't they? They might be, yes. <laughs> um, what about the former Bonds? Have you spoken to any of them? Has anyone offered advice? Or do you indeed look at their performances and draw from them in any way or, or deliberately act against type? Uh, God, that's a long question. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think there was even a question in there, really. Know, you but just sort of talked okay. at me for okay. 30 seconds. I'll ask you, have you ever seen a Bond movie? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? I've seen them all. I mean, I've seen every single one of them. I've seen them all at least two or three times, I think. You know, if I was, I'm a Bond fan. If I go and see a Bond movie, there's certain things that I think should be in a Bond movie, and they're there, and we've got them in spades, so yeah. it's, that's not a problem. I spoke to Piers. Piers' advice to me was just go for it. Um, I haven't spoken to anybody else, um, but I'm trying to kind of formulate answers to that because it's like question was you would get asked that, oh come on now don't come over all Gordon Ramsay on me listen listen sunshine that was a perfectly adequate question now now I'll tell you what I'm most looking forward to well I'm not actually no, I'm looking for loads of it but, but to what extent are you doing your own stunts to what extent are you involved in that because obviously there's been some weird stuff which I don't know mm. if you're aware of in the British press mm. let's dispel a couple of rumours one is that um, you had all your teeth knocked down mm -hmm. by a girl yeah I heard I, I may have got yeah. it wrong yeah. the second thing was uh, you not only can't drive a geared car mm. right you won't drive over 15 miles an hour it's all true what can I tell you I wish it were uh, everything that's in the press is true so you know <laughs> Look, I mean the thing is I know there's been there's been stuff in there and I, 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 I get it you know I mean I mean, nobody knows more than I do how important this is to some people, and you know, it's my job to get it right. So I get that. That's not that's not a deal. The rest of it, you know, I mean, there's that stuff been in the press, and then there's been some good stuff this week. And what do I believe? I mean, do I believe the good stuff? Do I believe? I mean, I'm just getting on with this. I think ultimately, when the movie comes out, it will be judged. Yeah. And your performance will be judged, and the film will be judged on its own terms. Yeah. And this is all kind of the inevitable foreplay that leads up to. I knew what I was getting into. I mean, obviously, you're approaching this like you would approach any role, I guess. It's a, it's a character. Yeah, you're playing a character. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. do you think, are you more conscious, OK, I have to try and make this my own? Well, look, put it this way. I'm, I, it's, I am approaching it like I approach everything, uh, everything else, but I'm also approaching it with that, you know, with Bond in mind. I've got to, I've got to, there's, there's no point in doing it otherwise. You know, we're not relying on a lot of CGI for this. Um, what you see is what you get. There's, I mean, I will be doing stuff and some of it will be me and some of it won't be me for obvious reasons. Well, can I stop you? Uh, Are you going to be doing the free running? Because I know there's that character earlier. I've done some of it, yeah. How's that? <laughs> Good. Terrifying? No, it's... it's it, yeah, you know what? I've had to sort of knuckle down and get over a few things. It's... I don't know. I'm kind of approaching every day as it comes, really. I mean, I get on set and I'm suddenly 200 feet up in the air and I go, OK, well, you, <laughs> you signed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're no stranger to the gym at the moment, I suspect. No. Uh, is this part of the thing as well? They say, you know, you have to do a certain amount of time. You were in shape already, weren't you? I know that. I but. just... Uh, I, when, did, when was it? October 14th? I think that was when it was announced. And I just said, there's no point in doing this unless I got in shape. Yeah. And but literally because I wanted to do as many stunts as I possibly could. And it's every day that sort of you pick up an injury, you pick up something, there's something just, you're battered and bruised. I mean, it's, um, and if you're not kind of physically fit, then it's difficult to get through. Uh, one final thing. Have you had a day's film yet where you've had to say, my name is Bond, James Bond? No. So uh, have you worked on that? Have you practiced that? No. Because that's going to be a, a strange moment. It's going to be a very strange moment. I've been in denial, I think. But Should we do a little improv workshop now? No. OK. <laughs> I'm, I'm pussy galore. Yeah. <laughs> I said no. 
There was a definite no. When you say no, I know <laughs> what you mean, really. What you mean is, draw it out of me. <laughs> I can see no, you're I can't do it. I'm not even slightly persuadable. I can't. You're not I really, I, I've not done it to myself. I've not. I think I looked in the mirror one night and sort of my my mouth moved and I ran away. Did uh, you never do it when you were a kid? Probably I did. Yeah. I think most of us I have. I think at some stage. most of us did. I think yeah. we were talking about the fact we used to play it in the playground and um, the other day, and my mate said, "Yeah, I was always M." <laughs> 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 Just, <laughs> oh, one of life's losers. <laughs> Not that Emmy's in a great part no. for my person. No, well, that, look, you know, God, Judy's doing this again, which is fantastic. That, that, is that fulfilled a, a dream the other day when we, uh, I did some scenes with her. Uh, Daniel, it's great to see you. I, I, I genuinely believe they got absolutely the perfect man for the job, really. Yeah. I was thrilled when I heard you'd done it uh, and nice. you, you'd signed well, on. Well, you called so. it. I did. You That's tried right. to call it on air, but I wouldn't let you. But Yeah, but I know these things, you know, and <laughs> let's face it, the Broccoli family have always listened to me first. Mm. I can't wait to see the movie, um, and I hope you stay in good health and survive the shoot, because I know you've got a lot more to come. It's great to see you. Casino Royale will be in cinemas everywhere from the 17th of November, though of course before greeting Daniel Craig as the new 007, we have a whole summer's worth of hot cinematic fare on which to feast. And as this is the last edition of Film 2006 until September, I leave you with my personal selection of the six upcoming movies which have me salivating more than any others. Goodbye, thanks for watching and hey, sizzle sizzle. Do you understand the meaning of the word foreboding? As in badness is happening right now. Anyone who says they can't cook is, is a stinking liar because it really is, this is just, you could not get more easy. Eating With continues with food economist Tom Parker Bowles, who shares his passion for food and good traditional ingredients. It's not only as good as I remember, it's better than I remember. Wednesday at 8.30 on BBC Two. The runners are now parading in front of the stands for the...